God's covenant with Abraham is regarded by most evangelicals as guaranteeing three things. Number one, unconditional blessing from God upon Jews as his chosen people, the apple of God's eye. Number two, unconditional ownership of Palestine, including the right to occupy it without obedience. Number three, God's curse upon any man or nation who curses Israel by opposing it by any means, including criticism. In this Bible study, I'll prove from Scripture that every one of these so-called covenant promises does not exist in Scripture. I will show that while a covenant between God and obedient Jews existed and still exists, the notion that God unconditionally blesses and gives land grants to wicked Jews is found nowhere in the Bible. Let's turn in Scripture to Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Here in this foundational scripture, God is establishing an everlasting covenant with Abraham because of Abraham's faith. This covenant is spiritual in that it applies to all, both Jew and Gentile, who are the spiritual seed of Abraham through obedience. But it is physical in that it promises a covenant land to an obedient Jewish people. God's covenant with Abraham and his righteous posterity is timeless. God has never broken or set aside his promise to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations and that his spiritual seed will occupy Palestine. As St. Paul clearly says, however, in Romans 8, apostate Jews have broken Abraham's covenant. They have broken God's covenant and are cut off and burned as dry, withered branches, having no inheritance in God or the promises he gave Abraham. So we have to realize that God has testified upon his own authority that he has an everlasting covenant with Abraham and no amount of Jewish apostasy is going to end his covenant with Abraham. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Jews, Jewish apostates, Pharisees, etc., the synagogue of Satan, they can break relationship with God and his covenant. They can exclude themselves from the blessings of God's covenant, which include rights to Palestine, God's chosen people, status, and so on. But the covenant which God swore to Abraham is inviolable. It lasts forever. Scripture confirms the conditional nature of God's covenant. Let's turn to Genesis 17, 9.
Actually, I'll start with verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now what is is uh, suggested here is that although we in the New Testament, according to Galatians, are entitled to consider ourselves the children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, and so on. And although uh, Scripture in Galatians also makes it clear that seed here is singular in reference to Christ, in this particular, in the context of this passage, there is a very clear statement that the Jews or the physical seed of Abraham in their generations have, uh, if they obey God, they have rights to a physical land uh, as well as a spiritual inheritance. And then in verse 9, God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is, this is clearly asserting that keeping a covenant ensures that that covenant remains viable. If that covenant is not kept by Abraham or the Jews or even by Christians, then we are no longer the children of Abraham. We are no Jews and Christians. No one uh, any longer participates in the faith and obedience of Abraham, and, and we have lost all claims to being beneficiaries of that covenant. On the other hand, as I just said, God's covenant remains with Abraham and with his righteous posterity, throughout all time. And then uh, in, in uh, verse 14, he says, and the, cir- and the uncircumcised man, he, he, he says here that he's given circumcision. Let me just read uh, 13. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. This is a specifically Jewish requirement. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Therefore, in the clearest language here, he is saying that refusal to abide in obedience to God means especially in this Jewish context, that that Jew is cut off from covenant promises. He is no longer, in fact, as Revelation 3 tells us, he's not no longer a true Jew. He is a part of the synagogue of Satan. He's one of those Jews who say they are Jews but do lie because he has broken the covenant of God. Meanwhile, again, that covenant remains in effect between Abraham and and his true spiritual posterity. Let's consider quite a few more verses here which uphold the conditional nature of the covenant. Genesis 18 and 19. God testifies about Abraham. He says, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Very important to keep the way of the Lord in order to uphold the covenant, to do justice and judgment. That in order, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. In other words, God promised to Abraham that his posterity would be as the stars of the heaven, as the sands of the sea, that he would be a blessing to the nations, that his his physical posterity would occupy the land, that he would be 
uh, father of God's chosen people. But he says they must keep the way of the Lord in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham all of these blessings, all of these covenant blessings which he hath spoken to him, uh, spoken of him. And then uh, Genesis 26, 4. <clears throat> Another covenant promise. And I will make of thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because, <clears throat> because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Can you, can you think of a clearer verse in scripture that, that lays the eternal foundation for covenant between God and the Jews it's based upon obeying God's voice, keeping his charge, keeping his commandments and statutes and law. Over in Deuteronomy 137. Moses is talking about how the Lord refused to let him go into the promised land because of one infraction. God's covenant always required obedience before any occupation in a national sense of the land of Israel. He says, Also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou thou also shall not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now the land grant, the right to go into Canaan land and dispossess the Canaanites and to enjoy this land of milk and honey was part of this covenant God established with Abraham And it could only be facilitated by righteous, believing people like Joshua and Caleb going in by faith. And it says here that the faith of Joshua empowered the penetration of the land. His faith, his example over that 40 years of exile in the wilderness because of the disbelief of the Hebrews, his faith empowered or capacitated the covenant to remain operational, to remain relevant to the Jewish people. He led as the standard bearer, as God's mighty warrior and champion. He he empowered the covenant to give a legitimate basis for occupation in a national sense of God's holy land. Deuteronomy 7.12 When, wherefore, it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thee. Clearest language saying, you, you Jews, you have got to keep. You've got to, number one, hearken in your spiritual heart and spiritual ears. You have to, you have to hearken to these judgment and keep and do them. 
in order for this covenant to be operational. 